I was blessed by that song. Thank you, Olivia, for playing that song. I was singing along in my head, how deep the Father's love for us. So we're on this 40-day journey of prayer. Today is a special Sabbath because it's Pathfinder Sabbath. We have the Pathfinders here. We have the adventurers here. We're all friends. We're here together to learn about prayer. Our sermon series, it's on the screen, If Humble, Pray, Seek, and Turn. It's taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14, which actually happens to be on our banner here in this church. You know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I love that verse. This morning, we are going to focus on that second part, prayer. This morning, we want to focus on what it means to pray, but before we begin today's teaching, I want to share with you something that is of utmost importance. Please listen. It is more important to know who you are praying to than to know what you are praying for. It is far more important to know who we are praying to than to know what we are praying for. This morning, I can give you uh, several biblical principles on how to pray. I can give you method. I can give you tips for your own devotional life, your own prayer life, but none of this will matter. None of this will matter if you don't understand this one essential truth, that God is your best friend. You need to understand that. We need to understand this without a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus, He is our best friend. And if you don't understand, if you don't understand that God is your best friend, you will pray to Him like He's some type of genie in a bottle, ready to grant your wishes. If you don't understand that God is your best friend, you might pray to Him like He is some impersonal being who doesn't desire a relationship. But if you listen to God's word this morning and you understand that God is your best friend, you will have a real and lasting friendship with God. If you understand that God is your best friend, you will have a real and lasting friendship with God. And I want to tell you, because of your lasting friendship with Jesus, you will have true happiness and joy. You know why? Because there's nothing more joyful in the world than being loved and loving our friend, our best friend, Jesus Christ. No other great, no other pleasure, no other joy can beat the joy of knowing and being friends with God. So this morning, I'd like to map out the direction of where we're going. We're going to answer this one question. The question is this. What does it mean to be a friend of God? Let's pray. Father, what does it mean to be your friend? And what does it mean for you to be our friend? Please, Open our eyes that we might see wondrous things in your law, in your word this morning. And may we see our best friend, Jesus. And in his name I pray, amen. To be a friend of God means, number one, that we talk together. To be a friend of God means that we talk together. I'd like to invite you to Genesis chapter 18. Whether you have a printed Bible or your Bible on your tablet or smartphone, I invite you to see this with your own eyes. Genesis chapter 18. Here we're learning about this man by the name of Abraham. And we're going to see this conversation, this bold conversation that Abraham had with God. Genesis 18, beginning with verse 23, if you're with me, please give me a big and hearty amen. 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 I love to hear that. Verse 23, the Bible says, And Abraham came near and said, 
would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, this is the prayer that Abraham is having with God. God is scoping out Sodom to see who is righteous there, and he, he, they are very wicked, they're evil, and he, he's about to destroy them, but Abraham has this conversation with God. Look at verse 24. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Verse 27, Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I am but dust and ashes. I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous, would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be 40 found there. And so God said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Verse 30, Then he said, Let not, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will, not, I will not do it if I found 30 there. And he said, Indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And look at verse 32. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. You know, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of audacity to talk to God like this. Have you ever talked to God like this? At least one thing is certain about Abraham. He had to be close with God in order to talk to God like this. In order for Abraham to boldly barter with the Lord, he had to have had an intimate relationship with the king of the universe. Do you have an intimate relationship with the king of the universe? What kind of relationship did God have with Abraham? You know what Isaiah 41 verse 8 says? It's on the screen. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham. And what are those last two words? He's my friend. The descendants of Abraham, my friend. And the next verse, James 2, verse 23, and the scripture which was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the what, everyone? The friend of God. Abraham was God's friend. That's why he could negotiate with him. God's heart was grieved when he saw the wickedness of Sodom. He was going to destroy the city and wipe their perversion off of this planet. But Abraham pleaded with God, Lord, you wouldn't destroy the city with righteous people in them. Would you? Did you catch the bold statement he made in verse 25? Or verse 20, 25? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, Lord. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What was God's answer? If I find 50 righteous, I will spare that city. Lord, I'm but dust and ashes. Would you spare Sodom if you found 45 righteous people, Lord? Abraham, if there are 45 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. What about 40, Lord? What about 40? Abraham, if there are 40, I won't do it. What about 30, Lord? If there are 30, I won't do it. What about 20? Please don't be angry. I'm just asking you, what about 20? Abraham, if I find 20, I won't do it. Here's, I have one more shot. Lord, one more request. What if you found 10 righteous people? Would you spare that city? God's answer, I will not do it for the sake of 10. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would have had the courage to talk to God this way. God was willing to spare Sodom because of Abraham's bold requests. And Abraham even had the audacity 
to remind God that it is not a part of his character to destroy the righteous with the wicked. The reason Abraham was able to talk this way because of one word. That one word is trust. God trusted Abraham and Abraham trusted God. You can't negotiate with someone. You can't even make a judgment about someone's character unless you trust that person. You know, there are things about my life that only my precious and wonderful and beautiful wife, Catherine, know. And there are things about her life that only I know. Do you know why? That's because we trust each other. We trust each other. We can affirm each other. We can negotiate with each other. We can share our struggles. We can share our concerns. Sometimes we can tactfully and compassionately point out each other's flaws. But in all of those cases, it's for the purpose of building each other up. I'm able to negotiate. We're able to share because we trust each other. But why do we trust each other? Where does that come from? We trust each other because we have spent time getting to know each other. We have spent time talking together. You know, we dated, we dated about three and a half years before we got married. We spent hours on end, on the phone, in person, video chat, talking to each other. You can't be a friend of God if you don't trust each other. Can you say amen? And you can't be a friend of God if you don't spend time talking together. So you have to talk to God in order to have trust. And you have to talk to each other in order to share what's on our hearts. I, my concern is this. I have a concern. My concern is that there are people sitting in this church, there are people maybe watching on our live stream, who think they are friends with God, but they hardly talk to God throughout the week. How can we be friends with God if we don't talk with Him? How can we be God's friend if we don't spend time talking to Him? Impossible. We can't be friends with God if we don't talk with Him. No wonder we don't trust God when the problems of our lives are too heavy to bear. We don't trust Him because we don't spend time talking to Him. God talked to Abraham. Look at the next slide. God talked to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram. Genesis 12, verse 7. Now the Lord appeared to Abram. Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram. Genesis 15, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Genesis 17, verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abram. Genesis 18, verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre. Genesis 21, verse 12. But God said to Abraham, did God talk to Abraham, yes or no? Yes. But it wasn't a one-way conversation. Abraham also talked to God. Just a few examples, Genesis 15, verse 2, but Abram said, this is to God. Genesis 18, verse 23, and Abraham came near and said. Genesis chapter 20, verse 17, so Abraham prayed to God. They talked to each other. You know, our Savior Jesus Christ also enjoyed talking to his Father. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 16 on the screen, so he himself often withdrew in the wilderness, and what did he do, everyone? He prayed. He often did this. He went to the wilderness to pray. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Next slide. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. To be a friend of God means that we talk together. Amen. To be a friend of God means that we talk together. You know, I found this article, I found it to be witty and cute. If you guys can even use that word, cute. The, the title of the article, How Not to Pray. So this man mentions, or this writer, this author, mentions several ways not to pray. First, he calls, he says, uh, he calls the first group or the first type of person the lecturer. He says, the lecturer's motive is to harangue someone else or the group by sermonizing in general. This is also known as the sermon prayer. Here's an example. 
Oh God, forgive those among us who do not understand the need to fill in the blanks. Or, Lord, forgive the congregation for their continued failure to tithe, for the tithe is the Lord's, and test me in this, saith the Lord, and on and on. Okay, so you have the lecturer. You also have the King James only prayer. Have you heard this before? As the quotation goes, he says, if King James English was good enough for St. Paul, it is good enough for me. For these people, prayer just seems more holy if spoken in a 300-year-old dialect as if God were somehow nostalgic for such ornamentation. Here's the example. We beseech thee, in thine tabernacles, O Lord, ye forgiveth the bowels of iniquity as an ensample, not example, ensample, King James language. Then you have the third type of prayer, pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing is generally understood as an admonition to not neglect our prayers or for us to maintain an attitude of prayer in all that we do. Not so with these people. They take it literally. They seem to think that prayer is to be preferred over all other activities in Christian life. And if you do not agree, well, that is too bad since they are praying just now also known as the eternal prayer or the prayer that never ends. Those who do this should never be asked to pray before a meal. Example, Lord, we pray for the believers in China, and Lord, we want to mention each one by name. Have mercy. Have mercy. This is not what talking to God looks like. Talking to God is not flippant. Talking to God is not cheeky, light, and chipper. Hey, dude, how are you doing? You don't talk to God that way. It's not light and chipper. You're praying before the God of the universe who owns the universe. It's not light and chipper. Praying to God, talking to God, is not going to Him and asking Him only for help, gifts, and blessings. Come on. God is not Santa Claus. He's not there just to give you good gifts. He is your friend. Talking to God is not occasional. Once in a while or maybe every other day. Or only saying grace before meals. That's not having a deep conversation with God. I like what Ellen White says, Messages to Young People, page 96. Please listen. Beware how you neglect secret prayer, prayer and a study of God's word. These are your weapons against him who is striving to hinder your progress heavenward. Beware how you neglect secret prayer and a study of God's word. These are your weapons against him who is striving to hinder your progress heavenward. The study of God's word. By the way, that's how God talks to us. He speaks to us primarily through his word. And prayer, that means that's talking to God. That's how we talk to God. God speaks to us to, through his word. We talk to him through prayer. These are weapons against Satan, the one who is working 24-7 to drag us off the path of heaven. A person who prays occasionally will only fight the devil occasionally. But a person who prays always will win over Satan always. Amen? Amen. So, Pastor... Please tell me, how do we talk to God? How, how can we talk to God? I want to share with you at least three practical pointers. Number one, believe that prayer is essential. You have to believe that prayer is essential to your spiritual life as air is to your body. Now, you might be able to go several days without food. You might be able to go several days without water. But what would happen if you went several minutes without air? You'll fall and drop dead. The only way that we can maintain a close relationship with Jesus is by talking with Him always. Amen. So one believe that prayer is essential, as essential as air is to your body. Number two, make time for God each day. You have to make time with Jesus a priority. Make time in your daily schedule to pray with God. I have a set time each morning to Jesus there on my calendar, and you can repeat it on my computer. Now, sometimes I miss that time. Sometimes I wake up later than I, I scheduled. But 
I make sure that even if I miss that time that I've set, that the first person that I talk to when I wake up in the morning is my best friend, Jesus Christ. Now, there might be someone here who's struggling with waking up in the morning. Anyone here morning people? Okay. It's like a third of the audience, maybe a fourth of the audience. <laughs> if you struggle, struggle with waking up in the morning, I want to challenge you. Pray and ask God to wake you up. It works. Now, how do I know? I'd like to invite my Pathfinder friends up front, my Pathfinder friends. And I want to share with you about a little experiment. Next slide. Just stop on this slide before we go on to the next. Okay, we're going to stop right there. You have that microphone. So this is what we did. We had a time wake-up challenge. I knew that it was going to be Pathfinder Sabbath, so we were thinking, what can we pray for? And so we decided as a group that every single day, we were going to pray, God, wake us up early. So I was praying for Maddie, for Ashley, and Amelia, and you were praying for me, right? Yes. Okay, good. I'm glad you were praying for me. I was praying for myself, Lord, wake us up early. So before I explain the details, now we did this, we tracked for about 11 days, and I'm going to share with you some details here, but I want to talk to my friends here about their experience. Let's start with Ashley, since you have the microphone in your hand. Okay. So what was your experience like when you prayed, God, wake me up, wake us up early in the morning tomorrow? Well, I really enjoyed the experience because, I mean, you actually see God working in your life because he actually wakes you up and you see him there because he did something that you can obviously see happen. So That's good news. Now, let's be honest. Did you have a hard time sometimes, some mornings, waking yeah. up? Yeah. Okay, does anyone out there struggle with waking up in the morning? Okay, you're not alone. I struggled. Ashley, you struggled. Share, tell us a little bit about that. Well, even if sometimes you may sleep in a little bit or, you know, you don't, it, it doesn't work out as planned, you can still spend that time and it will still happen more times. I mean, it's not the end of the world. You can still. That's a good do point. It's do. not the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Ashley. Okay, Maddie, next. Maddie, what was your experience like waking up each morning? Well, it was a very good experience for me. Um, <clears throat> I experienced spending time with God, and then it made my day happier, too. I was willing to be more patient with my siblings and my parents and my friends, and um, I was just happy, more happy. You were happier. Mm -hmm. By the way, I do want to say that this chart that you see is not an individual's pattern. This is all four of us grouped together. So this is an average of us four together. So we're not trying to point people out and judge them, okay? So Maddie, uh, was there a time when God woke you up before your alarm, or was there a time when he just woke you up early? So I have a problem with waking up with my alarm, and so for me, it was, I still had my alarm, but it helped me wake up with my alarm instead of after my alarm. Hey, Amen. So she heard the alarm, and you thought, okay, my friends are praying for me, time to pray to God, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thanks for sharing. One more, Amelia. Tell us about your experience. Well, my experience. First, I got the email that said, well, let's pray for God to wake us up early in the morning, and I thought, Oh goodness, dare I pray this prayer? <laughs> because I knew that God was going to answer it. And so I was like, okay, God, I'm going to pray that you're going to wake me up early. But then I also prayed, please help me to go back to bed afterwards because I'm extremely tired and I was going to bed way too late. Well, the first day, sure enough, he woke me up early. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was an interesting experience because I love how God answered my prayer and it was it's amazing to see that he woke me up earlier and earlier and earlier each day. Amen. So did you actually experience God waking you up early? Yes, like, I did experience him waking me up early. Some, some of the days, I think there was only two days where my mom had to come and wake me up. <laughs> but she, she could be from the Lord too. <laughs> yes, mothers are from the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, but um, yeah, I, I woke up earlier than I expected quite often. I was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> You know, I'll share a little bit about my experience. First of all, I want to say it's inspiring to pray with these young people who want to pray and praying together for this. You know, I, it wasn't hard. I mean, there were times where I just wanted to sleep in. And there, was, there were like at least two or three times in the last 11 days where I woke up, and Catherine, you can ask Catherine, I'm, not, I'm telling you the truth. I woke up before my alarm. One day I even woke up one hour before my alarm because I've been praying and you've been praying for me. God, wake us up. Does God answer our prayers? Does he want to be our friend? You pray this prayer, I want to prove to you he will wake you up. Thank you so much. You can have a seat. Can we give a round of applause to our Pathfinders and praise God for their 
willingness to join this crazy pastor in this praying to God, asking him to wake us up early. They don't know about this, but you notice this pattern on the screen. The reality is, this is how it is. We start a goal and oh, we mess up. We, we miss the goal. Sometimes we woke up later. Sometimes we woke up real early. Look at that peak on January 28th. I don't know what happened there. But look at the next slide. Here's what's most important. This is a trend line, an average of the average of how God actually woke us up in the morning. And sometimes you'll peak and wake up really late. Sometimes you hit the goal and wake up early. But the important thing is that God is waking you up. And I can share, and you can see on the trend line, that God woke us up almost 30 minutes early, earlier from January 19. From January 19. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, my friends, God answers prayer. Believe that prayer is essential. Make time for God. And last but not least, this third point of how to talk to God. Talk to God as a friend. I love this quote, Steps to Christ, page 93. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. You don't open your heart up to your boss, do you? Do you open your heart up to your postman, to the mailman? No. You share your deepest struggles and joys with your friends. Now, this is what talking to God as a friend might look like. I'm going to show this next slide to you. I want to make this practical as well. Praise, insight, surrender, requests, intercession. This is a pattern that I follow in my own morning prayer life. By God's grace, I was able to spend at least an hour every morning those last 11 days, thank you for my friends praying for me, and I follow this pattern. And you can write these verses down and read them later, but I begin my prayer, my time in God with prayer, with praise. And so this morning, I got on my knees, and I praised God. I, I actually journaled this out, and I have a list of things that God has a uh, list of things that I'm thankful for, how God blessed me the day before. And so I begin with praise, and I always end that praise, praise time. Thank you for Jesus' death, life, resurrection, ministry in heaven, and the hope of his soon return. And so I praise God for Jesus Christ. And then I enter into this time of reading. I call this insight. I like Psalm 119, verse 18. It says, open my eyes. The word says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And so right now, I'm reading through the Bible in a year. And I read through the year and I, I say, God, can you give me insight? Is there a verse that you're speaking to me about? And so what I'll do is I'll mark the verses that stand out to me. And at the end of this, this time of reading, what I'll do is uh, I'll ask God, Lord, what is the one way that you're speaking to me through all of these verses? And then when God reveals that to me, I enter this section, this time of surrender. And I say, God, I see how you're telling me to be a man who prays for the Holy Spirit through your word. Can you please forgive me for not being a man who longs to walk with you and talk with you and pray for your spirit? And I surrender my life and I say, Lord, please help me. Please, please forgive me. And then I do this in that surrender time. Instead of focusing on my surrender, I say, Lord, I surrender my life to you because Jesus surrendered his life to me. This is similar to what Pastor Michael does in reading Matthew chapter 27 on the crucifixion of Christ. I quote Isaiah 53 verse 5 and I imagine it in my head. But he was wounded for our transgressions. God in heaven, thank you for the nails that were driven through your hands and feet. He was bruised for our, not, our iniquities. Jesus, thank you for being bruised for me. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. He was ridiculed. Lord, you were ridiculed for me. And by your stripes, I am healed. Lord, you were whipped so that I could be healed. And I praise Jesus. I surrender because Jesus surrendered for me. Then I enter my time of requests. I have a long list of prayer requests on my phone, and I pray for each one, each person by name. I bring the request before God, and then I intercede. Praise, insight, surrender, request, intercession. To be God's friend, next slide, to be God's friend means, it means that we talk together. And last but not least, to be God's friend means that we walk together. It means that we walk together. I want to read for you a passage that illustrates the close relationship between God and Moses. And I had to include the book of Exodus because the Pathfinders 
are studying the book of Exodus for their path, Pathfinder Bible experience. By the way, they defeated the elders by a landslide a few weeks ago. So I'm reminded about the book of Exodus, about the Pathfinders when I read Exodus. I'm proud of them. By the way, they got first place last week. Praise the Lord. And they're going to go on to the next level. Praise God for your work. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. Notice this conversation that God has with Moses this time. Verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. The best way to understand this phrase face to face, I believe, is that God spoke to Moses in close proximity. God and Moses were tight. They were close. Moses enjoyed talking to God. Look at the next verse, verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my, say, in my sight. Look at verse 13, please listen. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. Did you catch that Moses did not ask for riches? Moses did not ask for material goods. Moses did not ask for a large army to fight their battles as the Israelites traveled through the wilderness. Moses does not ask for power. What does he ask from God? He asks to know God's ways so that he can know the Lord. He did not crave God's gifts. Rather, he craved knowing the giver. My friends, there is a fundamental difference between loving God because he gives you good things and loving God because you actually enjoy getting to know him. You know, there are children today who love their parents because they buy them nice toys and nice things instead of loving their parents because they actually enjoy the relationship with their parents. And we can't put all the blame on the children. Parents, I want to share with you something. Now, I'm not, I'm not a parent myself, but I've seen enough, enough, enough children and parents to understand this, that your children do not want stuff. They want you. Your children do not want things. They want a relationship with you. And may our prayer be, Lord, help me to cherish the Savior instead of stuff. Help me to want to know you, O oh Lord. This was Moses' prayer, and look how God responds. Verse 14. And God said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses says, Lord, please, please, Lord. I want to know you more. God says, Moses, I give you my presence. Verse 15. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, Lord, do not bring us up from here. Do you want to know the divine key of success? The divine key to success is having the presence of God with you. Just ask Jesus. Let's ask him. Why was Jesus able to cast out demons, resurrect people who were dead, make the lame to walk again, and cause the blind to see? The answer is in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. It's on the screen. Who went out doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Why was he able to do this? For God was with him. That is the divine key to success. The presence of God with us. My friend Dan, he went to Ghana for a mission trip. 
To make a long story short, during that week of prayer as he preached, these young people in the dorm were making decisions to follow Jesus Christ. He said that one time, the next one time he heard some commotion, next day he found out that lights were flickering in and out, off and on, in the girls' dormitory. He heard this, they prayed. Next day he preached his heart out, went to hang out with his two friends. He came back to his room and he noticed that there was uh, something, someone or something wrote something on his bed. He said, he prayed, Lord, give me your presence. He slept peacefully that night. The day for the baptisms came and all of the young people were at the beach. Congregation was there, they were singing. One person came, second person came, third person came. Finally, a young lady came who made a decision to be baptized. She came, she came there to be baptized and all of a sudden as my friend Dan and his friend were in the water, they looked in the distance and they noticed that that one girl was charging at both of them at full speed, screaming with a different voice. He was bracing himself for impact and all of a sudden some of the leaders, pastors, spiritual chaplains tackled this woman and they all surrounded this woman and they prayed for her. And do you know what happened after they finished praying? She was in her right mind. She was baptized, and now she is a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something, my friends, that demons flee when Jesus is around. Do you walk with Jesus? Amen. And do you know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus walks with you? You know, God gives us his presence so we can walk together. You know that hymn. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share when we tear we there none other has ever Jesus literally wants to talk with us. Amen. And he wants to literally walk with us, my friends. Amen. God wants to walk with you, but do you want to walk with him? Do you long for his presence more than anything? 2013 was an eventful year for me and my wife, Catherine. I graduated from the seminary in May. And I started pastoring in my new district in Wisconsin on May 15. I was enjoying my time in my new four church district, but there was one problem. Catherine was in Michigan. We had many phone calls, many video calls. Sometimes those phone calls would drop because of bad reception. Oh, I hate those times. Long distance was very hard and some of you here Married couples, or maybe almost to be married couples, know what long distance is like. It's not easy. But I had a really hard time because I was planning my wedding. We were going to get married in July, and I didn't have a chance to see and talk to my wife in person. We didn't see each other until the end of June, one week before our wedding. So that six-week break actually felt like six long, painful years. Oh, it was horrible. Oh, what was I going to do? But I want to tell you something. After I preached a sermon one Sabbath morning, I could not wait to get into my car and drive five or six hours to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you should have seen my face when I saw Catherine again. Oh, if you think my smile is big right now, it was 100 times this. <laughs> Six-week break, but nothing compared to being in her presence. Hallelujah. And then one more, one more week, we were married, so no more to be apart again. Praise the Lord. God longs to be in your presence. He wants to walk with you, my friend. But there are some people here who don't want to walk with him. 
There are some people here who think that life is happier without God in your life. You would rather live in this world than live with God for the eternal world. And I want to share with you that God can't walk with you if you don't want to walk with Him. Doesn't the Bible say in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, can two walk together unless they are agreed? So who is your friend? Who is your friend? Are you friends with the world? James chapter 4, verse 4, next slide. Do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If we are friendly with the world, we make ourselves enemies of God. So how can I be God's friend? Look what Jesus says, John 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. If you want to be God's friend, if we want to be God's friend, we have to do what He says. But then you might ask, why would I even want to do what He says? Don't miss out on the verse prior to this one, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for you so that he can be friends with you. Amen. Jesus laid down his life for us. I was an enemy of God, but because of his great love, I want to be God's friend. I want to do what he says. Do you even realize? Do we even realize that our best friend Jesus put his life on the line so that we can have true happiness with him? Do you realize that? Come on, every husband or husband-to-be knows exactly what I'm talking about. You spend months planning for the big proposal. Your wife-to-be has already been planning for five years, so she's beat, she's, she already has you beat. You spend months planning your proposal, and the day comes when you put your life on the line. What does it mean to put your life on the line when you pop the question, will you marry me? Come on, you put yourself, you put your life on the line because you don't know what she's going to say, really. And why do you even risk putting your life on the line? You risk, because, you risk putting your life on the line because you want to be happy with her for the rest of your life. Every, every time we reject our best friend Jesus, we are robbing ourselves of happiness. Every time we'd rather take a walk with the enemy, we are robbing ourselves of true joy. Every time we'd rather put Satan before the Savior, we are robbing ourselves of happiness. And I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, there is nothing more joyful than walking with my best friend Jesus. Can you say amen? Nothing more joyful than walking with my Savior, Jesus Christ. Nothing compares to walking with my best friend, Jesus. You can have all this world, take it, but give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Oh, there's much joy. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 129 to 130. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to Him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak His mysteries to us personally. Listen to this last line. Often, there will, be, there will come to us a, sweetful, a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often, there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. And my friends, I can tell you from experience, January 15, I started writing down in this new journal, Lord, can you please prompt me throughout the day to talk to you? Can you please remind me to quote scripture and to pray to you throughout the day? And I can tell you, January 15, all the way, almost every single day, actually, Genesis, we'll start with January 17, okay? Genesis, January 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, that I experienced Jesus, hey, Nestor, 
Hey, take a break from that screen, from your work, and quote a scripture and pray. It really works, my friends. It really works. And I'm living, I'm, a, I'm an imperfect example that God can prompt us, and that God can literally walk with us. To be a friend of God means that we talk together, means that we walk together. And when we talk and walk with Him, we will be overwhelmed with joy. The world and its cheap pleasures is nothing compared to the true pleasure of friendship with Jesus. I close with this last story. I was having a conversation at our joint prayer meeting. By the way, you should come and attend. It's so wonderful. The whole campus comes together there at the chapel at Campion Academy. We pray together. I was having a conversation with Carrie Jordan. She's listening to this book, which I have listened to, or still listening, I haven't finished it. It's called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Have you heard of this book? It's a yellow, bright yellow book, New York Times bestseller. There, Charles Duhigg shares this story about Michael Phelps. Do you know who Michael Phelps is? Okay, the most decorated, the most medaled Olympian in the history of the sport, of the Olympics. Coach Bob Bauman, Michael Phelps' coach, remembers when he saw this skinny but tall, lanky, young teenager named Michael. He saw potential in him and said, hey, he asked his mom, would you allow me to coach him to swim, for swimming? He said, sure. So Michael got into the water. Coach Bob, he saw a lot of potential in Michael. He saw each stroke. He saw that he would be a star. He tried to give him an exercise regimen, a sleep regimen, a an eating routine, but no matter how much he tried, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get Michael Phelps to stick with the routines. And so he scratched his head and he thought to himself, what can I do, what habit can I, for can I have help him form so that he can build these other habits in his life? And so we went to Michael one day and he said, Michael, tonight I want you to run the tape. And so this is what running the tape meant. Michael Phelps, he uh, was lying in his bed before he went to sleep, and he ran the tape. This is what he did. He imagined himself coming to the block, and you've seen him before, he does this thing with his arms, so he, he did his little routine with his arms. He imagined him in the perfect position to go into the water. He heard the crowd cheering, and he heard the beep. He imagined himself diving into the water. He imagined every stroke to the wall, first wall. He imagined the perfect flip. He imagined the perfect swim back to the final wall. And he imagined himself touching the wall, finishing first in the race. Michael Phelps practiced this every single day. And because he ran the tape because he formed this habit of thinking about winning. He then was able to form habits, good habits of exercise, good habits for sleeping, and good habits for eating. Charles Duhigg calls this the keystone habit. The one habit that you form that will impact all the other habits in your life. And the keystone habit in your walk and my walk with God is talking and walking with God every moment of the day. Amen. I guarantee you, you form that habit. Oh, Lord, I'm busy. These kids are hanging on to me 24-7. Can't get rid of them. You don't want to get rid of them. Just can't. Just hanging on to me. Lord, you don't understand. I have so much homework. You form that habit of prayer and you watch the Lord transform your life, you will be able to form other habits on your path toward heaven. There's someone here who's saying, God, 
I want to be your friend. I want to talk with you. And I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. And I want to walk with you. I'd like to invite you to pull out the Connect card that's in front of you on your pew. I have mine here. There's someone here who might be thinking, Lord, I, I want... I want to make a commitment to be a friend of Christ. I want to make a commitment in the rest of these 40 days to talk and to walk with you. If you're desiring that, I'd like you to write that, your desire under this section in prayer requests here. You can put your name, your number, contact information. If you're saying, Lord, I want to make a decision today to walk and talk with Jesus. Just fill it in there. I want... I make a decision to walk and talk with Jesus. That's the first request. By the way, if you're saying, Lord in heaven, I need your help. If you're you're struggling with physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual strongholds, come to our anointing service next week, next Sabbath afternoon at 2.30 p.m. You can experience God's power there. I want to say, if you have that request, write it there. Number two. Maybe there's someone here who's saying, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. And you're thinking, I have never been baptized. Mark down information on baptism on the back of the card there. Maybe you'd like to be baptized. Maybe God God is speaking to your heart. You're saying, I want to be re-baptized. Mark it on the card on the back there. If you're saying, Lord in heaven, I want to commit, or I have a special prayer request. Write that in also. We want to hear your requests. If you have a desire for prayer, a big burden on your heart, we as a prayer team want to pray for you. So that's prayer request. You want to commit your life to Jesus, write commit on that prayer request sheet there. Prayer request line, be baptized. Maybe you're a guest here at Campion. We're so glad and delighted that you are here. And you're saying, man, I like my time here. Write down first-time guest. We have a gift that we'd like to give you for being a first-time guest here at Campion Church. Put your name, contact info, mark down first-time guest. We'd like to get in touch with you. My friends, God wants to be your friend. Let us talk and let's, let us walk with him. Feel free to write the cards, write out on the cards. Continue to write on the cards as Alex leads in our closing hymn.
shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Oh, Father. What a joy it is to come into your presence. Thank you for being our best friend. And I pray, dear Lord, that we would continue to be your best friend, your friend who cares, who loves to talk with you, who loves to walk with you. Be with your people today. May we all be filled with your Holy Spirit. And may we finish strong in these 40 days of prayer. Please bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say, Amen. Just one more word. We're glad you've joined us today. You're always welcome to join us here in worship. But we want to be available to you. If you have a prayer request, we have a prayer team that are eager to be praying for you. If you want to connect with a pastor, ask a question. If you feel you'd like to help support these teachings being online, I want to invite you to contact the number on the screen, 970-667-7403, or the website. We'll put that on the screen for you. You go there, you can contact us, leave a prayer request, connect with us. We'd be honored to hear from you and how we can help you in your spiritual journey. But until next time, know that Jesus is searching for you.